This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Episode number 38 of Tiger's Talk with Chirko and Company. I am your host, Vito Jerome Chirko, alongside the pod father, the Doc, John Mack, a room from Doc and Jock, doing great things with that podcast and everything related to the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc, what's going on this morning here? Vito, it's always great when you're watching a baseball game. You, you, the Tigers were coming off of a, of a four-game losing streak, and you've seen a situation where you're like, okay, we're playing Oakland, a team we've had some success, um, we've had some success against. And all of a sudden, a storyline happens right in front of us. Love I can't it. wait to get your take on the news of the day regarding the Detroit Tigers. Tyler Collins did something that most athletes, whenever they do it, they face a lot of heat. They take a lot of criticisms. And when it happens, it blew up social media. Like, it was, it was a relatively calm night on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. But when Tyler Collins decided to flick off the fans, and not only flick off the fans, but add verbal to it and give that waving gesture motion to everybody, our Twitter page just absolutely blew up. It reminded me of Joe Nathan giving the bird, right? He did that as well, flipping the chin a little bit and negatively, you know, going after the fans. And they went after Tyler Collins in this incident here last night where he lost the ball in the lights, misplayed the ball, made a bad mistake in the field. And that's why the fans started booing. The boo birds came out. And he struggled at the plate consistently throughout the year. And that's another reason why I think they booed him. And because also another reason why he overreacted, I think, to that incident and to the fans booing him, which you have to deal with. And he's not even a big market, big name player who does get, you know, criticized and is prone to that, to the booing from the fans, to the negativity from the fans. Because when you're a lesser caliber player, lesser paid, you're not going to get as remember as highly criticized for your ass, for your mistakes, because they give you more of the benefit of the doubt. But now that he's done that with the flipping off of the fans, uh, the yelling, you know, the verbal stuff too, which had to be, we saw what FSG did to respond to that, which was hard to do, but they got a, try to uh, alleviate that from being seen, obviously, for the viewers at home. But it was ugly. He, he turned himself into a negative player. I mean, a negative reputation kind of player now. He really is that now for the Tigers at this point. But after the game immediately showed contrition and he was visibly shaken he was upset. He and should have been the right. That's like the, the right thing. Almost you have to do that. Yeah. So he came out and apologized right away. Does that kind of, you know, lessen the impact of what he did for you? Like he apologized right away. He didn't wait for PR. He just said, you know what, something I can't do. I was a little bit rattled to hear the booze. He came out right away. He admitted that he was, he was, at, he was you know, that he embarrassed himself. He embarrassed his family. He embarrassed the Tigers organization. I do give him a lot, uh, a lot of credit for facing the media, owning up to what he did right away. We can't have that, though, as an organization. You know, for me, I'm not a part of the organization. You're a harsh right judge. Should this... not accept that. I am a harsh judge of character at times, and a person's reputation can be, you know, detrimentally affected, negatively impacted just by one incident, and this one negative incident where he overreacted and called out the fans can affect him long-term now. His reputation is tarnished forever, and he wasn't a high-impact ball player, so you can't really uh, afford to have something happen like that of that magnitude. So now he's negatively affected his reputation going forward. And Osmus, right? This begs the question. I know you wanted to bring it up too about Brad Osmus. What should he have done in that situation after seeing what he did, Collins? Yeah. So so exactly. The thinking is across town. And when we talk to people on our podcast and interact with them on our Twitter page is that Brad Osmus is running kind of a light ship in that he kind of is a player's manager. He's letting them do what they got to do. And he's not a, a manager that's instilling a lot of respect into these players because you know, what's being shown on the field in terms of the base running mistakes, some of the, maybe the lackadaisical play, and now you got Tyler Collins who just feels the need to express his anger in that way. A lot of people will say, well, it might not be Brett Osmus's fault that this is happening, but it is a reflection on your manager when these kind of incidents pile up. You had Joe Nathan, like you said. You have a situation where a lot of people are looking at Brett Osmus and what's going on, and, and a lot of people were thinking, hey, if that incident happens – I think if Jim Leland's there, maybe it's reacted to differently, where he's immediately, immediately before the inning is over, into the dugout, tongue lashing in front of everybody and say, listen, you know, you know, I'm going to make an example of you for a situation where I want to instill that nobody's going to do this kind of stuff on my watch. But in the end, it didn't happen that way. He stays in the game. And as of this recording, he's still on the major league club. And Stephen Moya is mashing the baseball, 
in Toledo. So, you know, Tyler Collins made a big mistake. I think that Brad Ausmus maybe didn't have to, you know, go as extreme as what I want, maybe yell at him in front of everybody in the dugout. You treat him like a professional, but I would have pulled him immediately. He would have been sent to the du- he would have been sent to the shower, the locker rooms, and his night would have been done. And then talk to him at least in between innings. Maybe not give him a, a tongue lashing like you said and go that far with it. Maybe that's too extreme, right? But I think Leland might have done that, might have lit a fire under his behind, right? And he needed that Tyler Collins after doing that last night. He has to live and learn. And the thing is, I don't think Brad Osmus is teaching these guys lessons. He's not making them live and learn, right? Or be responsible and or accountable for their actions. So that's a mistake on Brad Osmus's part. But in the grand scheme of things, can he control that from happening for his players? No. The guy chose to overreact like that, and you can't control all that, those emotions in the heat of the moment, right? I mean, that's Collins just overreacting there, and to a major degree. But with that being said, Osmus should have taken the action, right? Should have been proactive, should have taken the initiative, and pulled him out of the game, at least after that half inning, and then talked to him man-to-man between that half inning, between those, you know, the half innings there of that game last night, of Monday night as we record now. It's Tuesday, and this will be released Wednesday. But So now, actually, with this being Wednesday officially, two nights ago with that happening with Collins, Osmus should have definitely had a man-to-man sit-down with them. And that's where he made the mistake as the manager, and where I think he's too lackadaisical. He's not leading these guys in the right direction and teaching them those vital lessons of learning, having to learn from their mistakes. So Collins really wasn't held accountable. He held himself more accountable, it looks like, than Osmus ever did or that Alavila ever did because, as you said, he's still on the roster as of this recording, Tyler Collins, right now. And I think with his struggles, too, and the the good plate production of Stephen Moya in AAA, I think Moya should be up and Collins should be demoted. And I think, too, sometimes athletes have to be a little bit more aware of what's going on around them. That day, it was a day where Ken Holland came out and was talking about how the Red Wings should, you know, the Red Wing fans should have lesser expectations. You just had the Pistons lose. You kind of should know that the fans of Detroit are really grumpy right now. April in the, April in the D was probably, you know, not, uh, not April in Detroit. It's April disaster. That's what it was yeah. the, this, this April. You know, the, the Pistons got swept. The Red Wings were, you know, eliminated in five games. The fans are grouchy. You're, the Tigers have a losing streak. And you come out and you don't, you can't assess that the fans might be grouchy. They might boo you. I mean, come on. Deal with it, bro. Right? I mean, man up, right? You're a professional ball player now. You got to deal with the boost. The biggest name ball players deal with the boost all the time. Do they overreact? Barry Bonds, did he always uh, cuss out fans and, you know, flip them off? No, I mean, guys like that have to deal with that all the time because they have a negative reputation. And Collins didn't even have a negative reputation. But guess what? He made a fool of himself. And now he has that negative reputation as a ball player, which stinks for him, but is is what he deserved after what he did. And I think athletes need to take a little bit of insight into what wrestlers do. Wrestlers don't care if they're getting cheered or booed. They just care that there's a reaction. Right? You want that reaction. You want That means if the fans are booing, they care. There's, yep. been, there's been games now early on this season at Comerica Park where it's been crickets, where it's been like no atmosphere, no vibe, around eighteen to 20,000 people. When you have that many people, they can still make a lot of noise. So I would take it as if I hear something, I know they care. They're yep. booing because they're mad that you made that boneheaded play. I would understand that's what they're there to do. Understand that fans are paying a lot of money. You know, for two tickets anywhere respectable, it's going to cost you between eighty and one hundred twenty-five dollars. And if you're in a situation where you make a boneheaded play, you, you chalk it up to a mistake, you move on. Yeah, you don't, you don't treat your customers that way. And I know it's the heat of the. I know I understand passion. I understand that, but I would have not expressed it that way. I might have. I might have let out an f bomb. Not at the fans. But you deal with it yourself, right? Yeah. You, you're mad at yourself. You're disappointed. You at walk yourself. away. You don't get yeah. disappointed at the fans for booing. You walk away. You drop the f bomb yeah. to, to yourself. To yourself, yes. And just or walk cover away. your cover your mouth with a glove. You yeah. put your glove over your mouth, and then nobody else sees it. The TV doesn't see it. They don't catch it. The fans don't see it. That's the way you got to do it. So you got to own up to it because you make mistakes. Everybody is prone to right. We're all human. But when you do, you get disappointed at yourself, and deal with it internally. You don't let it get the best of you in. Overreact. Now, to play devil's advocate, he did you know, speak to that when he was discussing his apology. He said that, you know, we're at home. You know, we do get a lot of boos when we're on the road. There are situations where, you know, we want to feel like this is our home field, that we're getting, you know, unconditional support. Do you at all identify with what he says and thinks that, you know, did the fans maybe overreact to just the, the Tigers were up 6 nothing. I mean, it was a situation. I know that they were invested in Jordan Zimmerman's scoreless streak, and, you know, it resulted in a triple because of the error. I understand that. But did the fans maybe overreact a little bit? Do you identify with anything that he said about that? And maybe the fans should not have booed? 
Well, you got to give ball players the benefit of the doubt. I think people think at times that these guys are machines, right? That they're not human beings. They are, so they're they are human beings. So they're prone to making mistakes. So, you know what? In the heat of the moment, you might misplay a ball, and that ball got you know it dropped in in front of Tyler Collins, and then also Justin Upton, remember, was right there and on that play too, and they both missed out on the ball because he got lost in the lights. Collins, it was his ball. He called him off, called off Upton. It looks like so. Collins made the attempt, was trying to look for it, couldn't find it. So in that game where they were winning already, you know what? The fans probably overreacted themselves by booing. But you know what? You can't always cut these players slack or give them the benefit of the doubt. When you make a mistake, you're probably going to hear some boos. Once again, deal with it, man. Okay, man up. Professional athletes, no matter what the sport, no matter what the league you're playing in, you're always going to be susceptible to fans booing. Home fans, road fans. So home fans can always cannot always show you love, okay, and support and affection. It's not the way it is. We're not cut out that way as fans, right, to, to never boo guys when they do make a mistake. So just deal with it, man up, be accountable. And if he would have been and not had, you know, done what he did and showed up the fans in the fashion that he did, this would not be a big issue right now. But he made it a big issue by overreacting and not being a man, not being a professional. And remember, that's part of the title, a professional ball player. He wasn't being professional, and that's another reason why. If the Tigers didn't already have a reason to send him down to AAA, this was the reason that put it over the top for why Collins should be demoted to AAA and why Stephen Moy should be sent up. Yeah, it's a big violation. I do think he'll get over it. Listen, Well, yeah, I mean, you got to live and learn, right? You like It happens one day, and it goes in one ear, goes out the other. That's how it should be, how you should be handling your mistakes. And that's what the best players do. They allow the mistakes not to get the best of them. Collins did there. Have you ever, Vito, ever reacted angrily in a situation where you had some regret? Now, I know it's probably not on a grand scale where you're going to have, you know, 18, 20,000 people. Because his gesture, if you really break it down, and uh, Deadspin had a great gif where he just stuck up his middle finger and then he said, F you all. F everybody. <laughs> everybody. He's like, F the world, F man. everybody. Yeah. He was saying that to his mom, his dad. To everybody. That's what it means, right? And you got to remember, too. There are kids watching. I know. That's where it's sad. That's My where it's nephew sad. was watching, right? and he said, why is he using the no-no finger? Like, how do, you do, yeah, how do you explain to your child what does that mean, and why is he doing it, right? That's a hard predicament to be in as a parent as whatever you may be to a child or something who's watching the game, Doc. Exactly, and so that's another opportunity where the fans are like, uh-oh, you know. And it's just, the, I think the reason why fans really get upset is that, you know, you start to think that, do these athletes really think of that? think about that about us? Does he really think F everybody? Does he really just, you know, if we boo him, think that he has the right to just say anything to us and maybe really feels that way, that he's really angry and frustrated with the fans? Because, you know, I would always look at it as, you know, I would be a little bit more calm and rational in terms of my performance. But I, I probably would let some things slip in terms of cuss words or things like that. But I wouldn't insult the fans. I would be like, you know what? I totally botched that play up. That was a terrible mistake. And I can't do that. And uh, sorry, Detroit. You know that was just a silly. I it got lost in the lights, man. It's like it's like you look up and you don't see nothing. It was it was super crazy. But to you know flip off the fans. Fans are upset because maybe there's a deep seated issue there going. Like, hey, do you really hate us? In the end, you know, do you hate the fact that we tweet about you? Do you hate the fact that you know we cheer and boo? Do you hate the fact that every single day we're really not talking about the performance as much as we're talking about firing your manager? Hey, these are things that are talked about. Live with it, though. The media does it. The fans do it. Fans will boo and cheer. Deal with it. Man up once again. Be a professional and don't let it get the best of you. See, I think, yeah, I think athletes are living in this, trying to live in this positive world all the time and try to spin everything that maybe they get lost up and, and they don't realize that there's like a lot of other opinions out there. And there's situations where not a lot of people are going to support you when you're a 9-9 nine and nine team and you got a $200 million payroll and you've just lost four straight. Come on now, you have to be. You have to have some more self awareness. Well, then he's probably thinking too. You know, it's not my fault that we're struggling. I'm not the sole reason why we're struggling, just because of making that error, that mistake of not fielding the ball when it was right there, could have been caught. But I'm going to say this: a lot of athletes get lost in the lights and the bright lights of being famous, of being professionals, and they lose then balls in the light. You can do that. And Tyler Collins lost the ball in the light. And I want to get Rashad Phillips' opinion now on this. And we're going to go to him right after this quick commercial break here on Tigers Talk with Chirko and Company. Looking for team apparel for your high school, your club sports team, or corporation? Then look no further than Top Cat Sales, located on the east side of Main Street in downtown Royal Oak, between 11 and 12 Mile. Through founder and former University of Michigan quarterback John Wangler's leadership, Top Cat Sales has developed a tradition of selling and distributing custom Adidas team apparel with the very highest quality and the very best service. Get your organization, school, or club team all in with Adidas today by going online to topcatteamsales.com. Once again, the website is TopCatTeamSales.com. 
TopCatSales.com. And also remember to follow Top Cat Sales on Twitter at Team Top Cat. Now with me on episode number 38 of Tigers Talk with Chirko and Company is Mr. Rashad Phillips, the all-time leading scorer in UDM men's basketball history and the head, the founder, the CEO of Skills Unlimited Training. Rashad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. How are you guys doing? Hey, very well today, and we got a lot of great news to talk about. But, hey, first and foremost, I know you're not a huge baseball fan, but we got to talk about Tyler Collins and what he did last night for the Tigers. He misplayed a ball. They got caught up in the lights for him, and it dropped in front of him. And the fans subsequently at Comerica Park last night booed him for his lack of getting to the ball and fielding it properly. Now, what he did in reacting to the fans booing him was very improper, very unprofessional, as he went on to flip off the fans and say a few choice words. Now, you as a former pro, a guy that dealt with the fans, how would you have reacted to that? And what would you say to Tyler Collins if you got the chance to talk to him today? Well, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be professional. You're, you're a professional baseball player, whatever, professional basketball, professional football player. And you cannot allow your emotions to get in front of your job. Your job is to to perform in front of people at the highest level with a, with a with a high standard of of character. And I think doing that again, I think he will take that back. And I think he just kind of got caught up in the the moment of of the of the game and the, and the moment of that that particular time. I think if he could do it over, he wouldn't do that. Now, how would you have dealt with the booing? And did fans, you know, at times, you know, get the best of you? Because like you said, in the heat of the moment, you're going to hear some stuff that you don't want to hear and you might overreact because, you know, it's human nature. Yeah, I just, I, I, I would have handled it a, a, a tad bit different, maybe a little more of a, a, a stare, but not any gestures from, uh, not any physical gestures or that things of that nature. I have been put in some, some trying times, uh, you know, playing in my day. And um, I can honestly say that I've never handled it in a manner of um, using a physical uh, gesture towards a fan because a fan is short for fanatic. And so you have to understand that sometimes people are not always there to support you, but there to criticize you. So knowing that you have to uh, be able to adjust to the atmosphere. And really, that's the responsibility of a pro athlete, right, where you're going to have to deal with the fans booing here and there. So just really man up and be professional about it. And I think that's really, it's in the title. It's in the title for a ball player who's playing in yeah. Major League Baseball. It's part of the gig, you know, it's part of the gig. And now, did you, have, did you have specific incidents that really stuck out to you that you remember right now in the back of your head where you did get called out by fans and you, you had a deal with some fans? I, uh, well, I dealt with it a lot overseas. When I started playing professional ball, I dealt with it more. Um, didn't have... Didn't have an issue with it in college because no matter what arena we went to in college, I always had some type of following of people that was actually cheering for me. But once I got to the professional ranks overseas, um, I dealt with some some issues in Italy when I, my rookie year. And, you know, I was 23, 24 years old, so that it, I had to grow up really fast. And I never handled it in, in, in a manner where it was disrespectful. I always stayed professional and just continued to do my job and knew what I was signing up for. Well, you know what? You are a professional, and that's why you're on here on Tigers Talk today. And let's talk about now your former teammate, Bakari Alexander, getting the head coaching job at Detroit Mercy. And you played with him for two campaigns, which included two consecutive NCAA tournament bursts. And as you know, I mean, you know this, obviously. You guys beat St. John's in the 98 NCAA tournament, and then UCLA, the Bruins, in the 99 tourney. So first and foremost, you got to tell me something here, Rashad. How long did you know that Bakari was taking the UDM head coaching position? <laughs> um, I've known it since he's been a player. Um, <laughs> uh-huh. I, 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 Bakari has always been the, the – he was our coach on the floor in college. And um, I, I, it was just evident. It was obvious that one day he will return to his alma mater and, and, and coach. So I've known since he's been my teammate that he would come back and coach University of Detroit. Now, what will Bakari bring to the table that was different from what his predecessor Ray McCallum brought? Well, he's a he's a he's a homer for one. Um, he he's he's played he's played there at his alma mater, and you have to take in the the, the fact that um, that Bakari knows the history of the school, and I think sometimes 
coaches go into jobs and not know the tradition of the school, and that can that can backfire. Um, Bakari comes in knowing the tradition of the school, having a a, a real relationship with the, the the community, and knowing the former players and knowing the former players' history. I think that helps in recruiting. I think that helps overall. And I think Bakari comes in with a, a huge amount of knowledge um, of the, the tradition of the school and city in itself. Now, what do you think will be missed from McCallum's time on the sidelines at Callahan Hall, if anything, in your opinion? I think that Coach McCallum was a guy that was a great offensive mind. And I think that they're going to miss the, the, the high tempo energy type that he brought to Callahan Hall. But I also think that uh, what Bakari brings is a little bit more sturdiness on the defensive end. You won't see teams scoring 100 points on his teams. And you're still going to get that excitement on the offensive end with a guy like Bakari who knows how to, he's going to copy the blueprint, the template that helped him become a great player and a great leader at that university. So he's going to, he already has a blueprint written out. Uh, the fact that he's been on the bench at Michigan and seen guys win, he's going to kind of bring a little bit of that tradition back home with him. And it seems like he has a sense of recruiting prowess from his time at U of M, getting guys like Mitch McGarry. And I would imagine, Rashad, he's going to bring in some more inner city recruits than maybe Coach McCallum was able to pull in in his time at UDM. Yeah, obviously, Bakari has a, a gang of knowledge and not also that he's a very knowledgeable intellectual uh, person. It's the fact that the relationships that Bakari has built over the years, um, and, and that goes a long way with recruiting. His recruiting stretches all the way from, from Michigan to Florida to California. So when you have that range of relationships with people, that helps the recruiting stage. And, and, and he's He's a great coach, and he hasn't coached a, he hasn't he hasn't coached a game yet. But I'm already telling you that he's a great coach because I know what I know about him, and um, uh, this is this is the best hire that the university has ever had. And I can go on record saying that because it's not all it's not just the coaching that you get with Bakari. Um, you get the total package and the person that he is. Him molding young men to go out into the world when they're done. His charisma with these families, and I think that his leadership will rub off on the university as a whole. And that's what we need um, as an institution is leadership. And that's what he brings. Now, I wish I was still there to witness all of this, you know, going on with Coach Bakari and what he can bring to the table with his leadership. And I wanted to second into this now regarding his coaching staff. I don't know if you're willing to reveal this, but I'm going to ask it. Who have you heard will be on that coaching staff? I have no idea. And that's a fair and honest answer. Just wanted to ask it. And now, if you got the call from Bakari to be an assistant, would you take that job, though? <laughs> well, that will be a kind of a, a tricky situation because of the position that I've put myself in. I have so many students in Skills Unlimited. So for me to abandon what I've built by myself, I don't. I would think I would be doing myself and the kids in my program uh, uh, injustice in that matter. But on the flip side of the coin, it would be such a great, it would be a great opportunity to work alongside, first, first and foremost, my friend and my college teammate. And I think that that's something that can be revisited in, in the near future. But as of today, I have some things that need to be done with a lot of my students that's in my program. But I can tell it would be tempting. It would be very hard to resist that call from Bakari, huh, to be an assistant. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's a, that's a phone conversation that I would have to take because of our relationship. Absolutely. And how about these Titans now? After finishing 16-15 and 15 last year overall and 9-9 nine and nine in Horizon League play, how many wins do you expect from your friend and former teammate Bakari in his first season leading the squad? I would say 20. I would say 20 because if you look at 16 of those wins this year and you look at 15 of those losses, I think – Four to six of those games were easy, easily winnable games. And I think a lot of those losses come down to a matter of, of, of a mistake made in the last two minutes of the game. Minor, minor adjustments that I think um, with Bakari's mindset that he'll be able to kind of uh, maneuver and uh, work around those slight mistakes that have cost us four or five games. So that's why I can easily say that he can win 20 games in his first year. 
Now, as part of Big Vito's over-under, where do these guys finish in Horizon League play? Over or under fifth place in the Horizon League? I say over. Okay, and then where about? What are we talking here, they, Rashad? I say they finish. I say they finish four, four. Well, you know what? With that, Rashad, I will let you go. Thanks for all the insight. All the talk about Tyler Collins and about your your front and former teammate Bakari taking over at UDM. Have a good one, Rashad, and I'll talk Thank to you, you soon. Thank you. Back here on Tigers Talk with Chirko and Company, episode thirty eight of the podcast, alongside Doc. He's in studio as usual. When are you not? Right, you're always here doing something psychology related or right here co-hosting a podcast. And Doc. You know, he brought up that Bakari, his his friend, his former teammate there at UDM, played two years with them, and they were very successful, by the way. Beat St. John's and UCLA in consecutive NCAA tournament appearances at UDM. That's like unheard of now at UDM. I mean, I never even witnessed that. And Ray McCallum's son, Ray McCallum Jr., was at the school, and they only made the tournament once and lost to Kansas. Got routed in the first round, and Kansas made finals that year. But he brought up, wanted to say, Bakari. His, once again, his, his friend, former teammate, taken over now, and he called it the best hire that UDM's ever made, even though they've had Dick Vitale there, they've had Perry Watson, who he played for, who was also an assistant at U of M before taking over the gig at UDM. So it's the same kind of process right now where bakari has gone from being an assistant at U of M, where he was for six years, to Detroit Mercy, where he played, and actually he was an assistant at Detroit Mercy under his former coach, Perry Watson, as well, for a while. Yeah, I had a chance to interview Neil Rule. He's a big guy there at uh, Oakland University, does the play-by-play. And the Metro Series has been a little bit one-sided the last couple years. And now with the hiring of Bakari Alexander, you're going to get a chance to recruit better. And and obviously, in terms of being a basketball coach, the expectation will be to compete in the Horizon League and to make some NCAA tournament appearances, recruit very well. And, you know, UDM has has a good history of basketball there, but they need to take that next step. And there was a lot of whispers regarding Coach McCallum in terms of the success of the, of the team. And, you, and, and you know, Rashad explained it, that really on the defensive end, they need to really look at that and definitely improve upon that. But I expect them to have a lot of success. And, you know, you, of course, with, that, with any new situation, you got to give him some time to instill his program and bring in the players that he needs to. But, you know, by all accounts, he's going to go out there and get the guys and make the Metro Series much more exciting and to uh, really raise the expectations over there at, uh, at uh, UDM. But... Yeah, I like the fact that you tried to dig a little bit and you had some insight and uh, tried to see if maybe Rashad, because he did, you you could hear. Through he the, liked it. He oh, wants to take over. He yeah. just said right now it's not the right well, time for Right. It. You could sense that, you know, they're very close, so it naturally leads you to believe that, hey, if he shoots him a call, because Rashad was a big part of that team too. He was. A great score. Great score. All-time leading score, by the way. Not just a great score, mm-hmm. my man. So he did it all. And now they're going to bring, I think, uh, Jermaine Jackson back on board. He was an assistant under McCallum and McCallum's last year at UDM. He can bring his son in. His son actually plays at Dakota right now, Jermaine Jackson Jr. So his namesake, great score, undersized guard, but can score the basketball with the best of them. Kind of like a Rashad Phillips, which is funny, because Rashad's undersized was a great score, two all-time leading score. So Jermaine Jackson's son, Jermaine Jackson Jr., might be on this team, and that's the reason why they're probably going to keep Jermaine Jackson Sr. on the squad as an assistant for a long time there, really as long as Bakari stays at UDM. And it's a massive contract, a seven-year deal, which I couldn't believe, that long of a contract. And I love it. And if Rashad's right about his guy, Bakari, well, then he thinks this will end up being a great move by UDM and a move that will produce a great rivalry with OU in that Metro Series. It could be the best it's ever been. And I think Bakari, too, wants us to be a true rivalry and will go after it, will attack OU and make it that true rivalry for every sense of the word. Because really, Ray McCallum didn't really attack it with as much of ferocity, you know, not as much intensity for that series and how much it should have been. I mean, OU also took advantage of UDM in a lot of a lot of games. They owned us, you know, owned UDM for a long, long time. And really, it hasn't been a true rivalry because UDM hasn't beat OU enough head-to-head now. But now Bakari wants to. You know, he intends on making this a true rivalry where UDM will go after OU and will beat OU. And you can follow Rashad Phillips at... RP3 Natural, and definitely check out his basketball skills DVDs yep. at rpskillsunlimited.com. That's rpskillsunlimited.com. Great basketball DVDs, and uh, check out the work from Rashad Phillips. You'll probably be hearing from him a lot more going forward. All right, yes, let's, sir. Let's get back to these Detroit Tigers. Tigers. So now, as we record this, they're sitting at nine wins, nine losses. Ken Rosenthal wrote an article. You know, he's a Major League Baseball national writer. FoxSports.com, he came out with a, an article on Tuesday, and he kind of said that, you know, when discussing Brad Osmus, he said that, listen, it's not all Brad Osmus's fault. This, you know, situation with the Tigers maybe is a little bit more deep-seated 
than just the manager in terms of a- aging veterans, in terms of the contracts that have been given out, and really in terms of the fact that who are the leaders on this team? Brad Osmus, you know, is a guy that's laid back, is professional, but I, I think he's an okay leader. But the inferences that were made by Ken Rosenthal in the article were that, you know, this team might have some significant issues that are, even if Brad Osmus is fired, maybe irreparable, maybe a ball club that with, even with three, four different types of managers might be troubled. Do you think that, and a lot of people are talking about it, that even if we replace Brad Osmus, that it'd be worth it? Because I'm starting to think that, you know what, maybe it's just the players and the mix of, you know, the players that were assembled by Dave Dombrowski and now Avila, just maybe not the right mix. It's not the manager. It's a mix of talent to a certain degree, and the talent evaluator, what they're doing in terms of providing talent right on the field for the ball club and for Red Osmus to work with as the clubhouse you know, manager, as a skipper, making the lineups and everything, and dealing with the in-game strategy of when to put in, when to pull out pitchers, all that kind of stuff. And he has made mistakes in that regard in, in terms of his in-game strategy, and we've hammered him, right, for all his mistakes in the past. And even leaving Tyler Collins in the game last night, leaving other guys in the ball game in the past when he shouldn't have, or, or benching the likes of Justin Upton, and Miguel Cabrera the other day when they're big, high, the highest paid ball players on your team. You know, offensively they are. So why did you bench those guys? Why do you do certain things? But also it's about the talent that he's able to work with. And this team as a whole is not the most deep, talented team. It really isn't. The talent doesn't run deep from roster spot 1 to 25 for the 25-man roster. And that's on the GM, the higher-ups in the front office of the Tigers. So, yeah, it's not entirely on Brad Osmus, but guess who's always a scapegoat? It's not really the GM, and not when it's his first year as a full-time GM and executive vice president of ball club operations. It's going to fall on the shoulders instead of the manager who's in the third and final year of his contract as the skipper of the Tigers. And even if they went to another manager at this point, this early on in the season, and gave him the interim tag at least, such as a Jim Leland, who's a special assistant right now, to Al Avila and the Tigers. Well, if he did that, went down that route, it's still a guy that, you know, what, what could he really do with this ball club? Is it really talented enough even for him to turn the page, to turn around this ball club, you know, in time to allow them to be in contention, to contend for the division title, you know, to contend at least for a playoff spot via the wild card? I don't know if he's even the right man right now or if he would want the position because I think a guy like Jim Leland is smart enough to see the writing on the wall at you know, the advanced stage of 71, that this ball club's not in the right state to really compete right now to contend for a division crown. So why am I going to exert all my energy to take over this ball club and to try to right the ship when I'm 71 and maybe I don't want this kind of role right now? See, I think when we're talking about the Tigers, an issue that maybe some people are having is that, well, you signed Justin Upton, and he's a guy that's kind of been bounced around Major League Baseball, waiting to, for him to kind of fulfill his potential, waiting. Everyone's been waiting to see, okay, can this guy, you know, he's had successful seasons, but not consistently. He's a good hitter, but he's been run out of, he's been run out of uh, Arizona, yep. Atlanta, San Diego. And so my boy, Kenny, he, he tweeted us a series of things regarding Justin Upton. And he was like, he's a uh, J-Up hater, huh? Here's, what a, it is? here's a couple of his tweets to us last night. He said, no one wanted to listen to this Braves fan when I said Upton was a bad sign. No, he's a star. And then another tweet followed up with, there's a reason this bleep was run out of Arizona, Atlanta, and San Diego. <laughs> Check Atlanta and see what Upton does to a team. And so... Oh, come on. He's blaming Upton for all of the brave struggles? Come on. In recent woes, no. It's on, the, it's on the club as a whole, right? The collective unit that is the lineup, that is the rotation, is the pitching staff. You know, it's not a one ball player. Never is, never should be. So, Kenny, sorry. You're speaking out of your behind a little bit there. Okay, but I think he has a point with Jay Up being overrated. Okay, his stock being too high and the Tigers overpaying for his talents. That is true, I think, and that's why they gave him an, an opt out clause as well, in my opinion, because they know that he struggled kind of last year in his last year with the Pods, and he might be that kind of ball player that does have prolonged slumps at the plate at times. And K's far too often with 31 K's already to his name this year in 17 games, 18 games played now on the season for the Tigers. So. He's played in all these games, but he continues to struggle to not get out of his hitting slump, and now it's prolonged. And if he keeps king, this will be a disappointing signing and really a bust as a free agent signing for the Tigers. That's what we're saying is that, you know, Al Avila made a splash, and uh, Mr. Illich has liked to bring in these guys and say, hey, I do care, but now we have to start asking, why spend the money on these guys? You haven't gotten a ring. You haven't advanced super far in the last couple seasons in the postseason. Maybe you just need to, like the Red Wings, build a different way, you know. Now, it's like... You better play those young players, unlike the Red Wings do, huh? Exactly, like in reverse. 
you know, with the Pistons where, you know, we're all asking for that superstar. They're going with the hardworking team, building a young core. The Tigers, you know, famously have depleted their minor league system and brought in stars, not homegrown talent. And so the question you might have to ask, and maybe we'll delve into in in future podcasts is, is the philosophy of buying a championship, which the Tigers are obviously trying to do, going to be effective? Now, they're trying to build through free agency and trades and, you know, moving assets like a David Price, but... You know, we may not be able to advance deep in the postseason without that strong minor league system. And now you're seeing what happens when Dave Dombrowski infiltrates that minor league system, pilfers it, tries to, you know, do what you can and buy players. It hasn't been effective. And right now you're looking at, look, look at Kansas City. They suck for so long. And because of that, they were able to, you know, build and have. And, and the issue is this. If you're going to spend $200 million, Vito, I'm not looking for 99 if I'm the man, if I'm the owner, I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, I'm spending all this money. What am I doing? Because the fans aren't, you know, that'll get you uh, opening day sellout. That'll get you a couple, you know, early or early crowds. But if the team collectively is not winning, you could sign four hundred million dollar payroll. If the team's not winning, no one's going to show up. So I think the money, when you look at it, should should have been allocated differently. And I think the Tigers, you know, when Alavila really sits back and looks at it, maybe you should not build this way. Well, I think Mike Illich pushed for the Justin Upton signing, right? I mean, he wanted, actually, Chris Davis, remember, first. He would have had to play at third base, and that would have just messed up everything for the Tigers' roster and how it's structured. But adding Justin Upton was not the worst decision in the world when it first happened, right? But now because he struggled, we're all placing the blame upon his shoulders, do you think but it's not just on him, yeah, too. But do you think he'll come out of this lump? Well, look at it. He's got, I mean, his OPS, 562. Come on, that's below league average. That's a minor league caliber player's OPS. He's going to be much better than that, and at least produce around the 800 OPS. OPS for on base plus slugging percentage. So you're busting down. out the relax. Relax. Again, cool down, calm down, settle down, and relax. Just relax, baby. It's all you got to do right now. It's early on, and they're 500 at least. They're not under 500. They're 9 and 9, and Upton will come out of this prolonged slump. He is better than this, okay? And remember, it's his first time playing in the American League, okay? So this won't be an albatross of a contract. As Chris Davis's would have been, let's say, for the Tigers, creating that log jam at first and third base, like I said prior, you know, about, you know, regarding all this and Illich's philosophy of spending big. And you know what? It hasn't paid off. It really hasn't paid the dividends that we thought it would, or we haven't reaped the benefits by winning a World Series title as we should have by now, right? With all his spending of $200 million for his ball club. So his philosophy is flawed, but he's a billionaire owner. He's not thinking with anything else but his checkbook, right? And it's his money he's wasting. We're not wasting it. So for me, I want him to buy talent instead of sucking it up like the Royals did for five, six years and then banking on the fact that your young roster will turn around the ball club. You can't bank on that all the time either. And even look at the Astros right now who have turned it around by being young, building depth from their farm system. They're, they were 6-12 and 12 just a few days ago, and they were World Series favorites. So it doesn't saying, necessarily listen, mean you know, success will what happen. I'm saying, what I'm saying, club. if you're going to be an 80-85 to 85 win team, you got to cut the payroll to $100 million. You got to cut the payroll in half. But that might mean the Tigers are not even an 80 or 85 win ball club. Hey. Remember that, too. They cut it by that much by 100 mil. They're probably a 70, 75 win ball club. Then you have to be that bad for five, six years. Hey, you can build through the draft, but it doesn't mean you're going to be listen, successful after those listen, five, Vito, six years either. You're starting to build the reputation of being the Yankees without the rings. You know, you, what are you going to spend? 300 million, 250? What's the threshold going to be? Year I think in, this year is out? it. This should be it. This should be the limit. But I wouldn't say cut the payroll extremely to 100 mil, though, either. They're not a small market ball club right now with the Illich. You know, with Mike Illich being the owner and being willing to spend, and as he has been, and I think he will continue to be because he's getting older. He can't wait five, six years for this chip to turn itself around and right itself. This is about winning right now, and the way of doing that is by buying ball players, which is sad but true. And the Yankees tried it. They have succeeded. They've won, but they haven't always won. And remember, now they've turned it around, their organizational philosophy, by building now from within their farm system and having players come through that to the Major League Ball Club and contributing to the Big League ball club. And that's their way of winning right now. So the Royals have done it, and they've won a World Series title now. But it doesn't always mean success will happen for those ball clubs that are building from within either. Remember that. So, you know, that's why you can't really fault Illich for totally or for the Tigers for totally building this way. And remember, this was Dave Dombrowski's philosophy for building a team, more than I think Al Avila's. I think Avila will want to cut payroll in the near future. And if the Tigers struggle as much as they have already and struggle even more going forward, forward this year. I think they will start cutting payroll more and more as the seasons go along. Okay. No, I'm just saying that, um, you know, this is some of the reasons why the fans are a little bit angry, a little bit upset. And your brother Dom must be in heaven, dude. The oh, White he's Sox, loving it. 
fourteen and six. As we're recording this, the Tigers are four games out of first place. You know, I know that the White Sox probably aren't going to keep this pace, but they were a team that was looked upon to be uh, significantly improved. The Royals are sitting at twelve and seven. So, well, they're going to be good. We know that. But I think the White Sox will fall back down to earth because they can't hit as well. And they really haven't even hit this year. Guys like Todd Frazier, the top father. Jose Abreu has struggled out of the gate. Kind of like Miguel Cabrera has for the Tigers. So White Sox won't keep it up. I'm telling you right now. So calm down, relax. And remember this, the Tigers, in my opinion still, this is my prediction, only mine, but they will finish better than the White Sox this year in the AL Central. I got a quick Twitter video in mind after we record this okay. for you. Okay, okay, for all the fans out there that are panicking. Got you. Yeah, got calm you. down. Like Aaron Rodgers once famously said, relax, guys. And they ended up winning. The Tigers this year can win. They can. Now, they have some major ifs. And it's not all about Justin Upton struggling and their lineup struggling. Because okay. I think he'll come out of his struggles. Miguel Cabrera obviously will. He might have already broken out of his early season struggles by hitting those two bombs against against the A's. I think he's out of it already. Okay, so And uh, I wanted to say, though, the rotation, those are the major ifs. That's where I see concerns there, the three through five in that rotation right now, Doc. Okay, before, now, we've definitely been complaining a lot. We're definitely we have. looking at some I think of we've the, done that the whole entire podcast today, right? Yes, yeah, so let's look at some of the positives. The okay. Jordan Zimmerman signing has been outstanding. The bullpen seems to be much improved, and if Miggy can come out of his slump, they've been relatively healthy outside of the injury to McCann. So we're looking at a situation where the signing of Jordan Zimmerman has been outstanding. He's got his stuff. He gets guys out easily. The ball games are relatively paced very well. He gets guys out, and I'm enjoying him being in the rotation. I like the I like it when we're ha- we have leads. And we have situations where you can go to uh, Justin Wilson, Lowe, and then K-Rod. Now, K-Rod's been a little bit of a concern. We don't know if he's dealing with personal family problems as he's now on a current leave of absence from the club. So, his, his I mean, giving up back-to-back ding-dongs wasn't great. Ding-dongs? That, ding-dongs. <laughs> but uh, he got the, he still got the save. Mm-hmm. You know, it made it a little more challenging than it is. But Who hasn't, right? Exactly. So the situation now is this. The ball club just has to play a little bit better, a little bit more consistent. I think they're going to play well versus Oakland. And this team, you know, it's a little bit concerning within 20 games. You've already had closed-door team meeting type situations. Well, get it out of the way, though, now, right? What? Instead of having it happen later in the season when it is a really big-time issue because your team might be hugely out of contention. And right now they're four games back. The White Sox have been great out of the gate. The Royals have been, too. I, I said the Royals will stay there. White Sox probably won't remember, too. Now, when you look at the score lines yep. of the Tigers, yep. when they've won games, they've gotten a lot of hits, yep. 8 to 10 over yep. uh, in terms of hits per game when they've yep. won. They've won uh, games by wide margins. And the games that they've lost, they've kind of been closer games and things like that, or they're games where they're not hitting. Do you think this team is going to be going forward, continuing to be hit or miss, where they win game 7-2, and if they lose games, it's going to be 3-2 to two or 3 nothing. Or do you think it'll even out and they'll be a little bit more consistent? Because right now, it seems like the current squad, 9-9, nine and nine, is boom or bust. I think they'll win more of those close games going forward, too. They can win more of those one- and two-run games, I think, because their lineup will produce enough, and their pitching, you know, once they get Norris back, I think will be better as well. They're 1-5 through five in the rotation. And I, I still expect JB to be more consistently productive, too. And Zimmerman, if he pitches the way that he has already. I mean, you were saying you were happy with his performance so far. Well, who hasn't been? Come on. ERA below 1.35. That's sharp so much. That's brilliant, his performance so far through four games, four wins, and four starts. You can't be better than that. Come on. And an ERA below 1 like that, and his ERA, let's see, ERA plus is the best in baseball right now, too, at 1,000 above the league average, 1,077, along with that below 1. That peerless, right? I mean, that perfect, pretty much ERA, you can't do much better than that. So I expect him to be, you know, to come down to earth. He will a little bit, but he's still a very high quality number two. And right now, truly, he's the ace arm in this rotation. So for JV, he's got to slot into that number two rotation spot at least and be that good. Doesn't have to be the dominant JV who brings his varsity stuff every fifth day for the Tigers anymore, but still that consistent number two productive guy. He's got to be that where he can go the seven, eight, innings and still throw the 100 plus pitches. He can't be throwing 100 through five innings and then coming out of the game that early, okay? That can't be what is going to happen for JV going forward if the Tigers plan on contending for a division title legitimately this season. And then Anibal Sanchez, he's another guy I got to talk about, and he's my first we're going to do the buster now of the week. And I got two. It's Upton and also Anibal Sanchez, a number three starter right now in the Tigers' rotation. And look at his lack of productivity as a whole so far this season, Doc. It's been laughable. It's been putrid. As through four starts this season, he has a seven, an exact seven ERA, and a walk 
and hits per innings pitch mark of nearly two at 1.89. That is not good. That is not cutting the mustard seed at all for him as a number three starter, let alone a guy that would be a number five starter in a rotation, any major league ball club's rotation right now. Because that is minor league caliber. That's a triple-A starter right there, how he's been pitching so far. And that's why he's one of my busters of the week for this edition of Tigers Talk. And remember, he allowed 10 earned runs. Now, 10 in his last two starts to go along with four home runs in his last three starts. Simply put, once again, he has not been cutting the mustard seed thus far for the Tigers. And also, the same can be said about Justin Upton, as we've talked about. Too big of a contract to not be living up at least close to the bill. And Upton has to turn it around. He did all right. He did pretty well, right, against the A's in Game 1 there Monday night. I think he's starting maybe to turn it around. And I think he's prone to slow starts in his major league career. You know, has shown that in the past. Which, sad but true, that is the case then for the Tigers and what they have to deal with for him coming out of the gate. And guess what? Like I said before in this podcast, too, it's his first American League ball club that he's playing for. So him being this highly productive guy out of the gate, I don't think we could have expected that, and we shouldn't have out of Upton Doc. Now, you might think differently, though. No, no, I agree with you. Your your Buster Awards are well-deserved, and we definitely need to have Justin Upton, you know, definitely pick it up, and we need Anibal Sanchez. That's a big concern because $16.5 million or so uh, allocated for your number three guy. He's been nowhere near effective, and he's not getting innings. And uh, just before the season started, we all said that, hey, this is a guy that we were counting on to stop slumps was to be the, the you know the stopgap if there's an issue with Zimmerman or Justin Verlander. He's been completely disappointing, and he's got to turn it around. And I'm, I feel like he, you know, maybe given a couple more starts, but if they if these starts continue to be this challenging, then you're going to have a problem going forward. But now, on the other flip of the coin, the Podfather has some toasts that he'd like to give out for those that have had a good start to the season. Okay, so I, it's toast. The, so you're either a buster or you get some toast. The, now, with jelly? Grape jelly and butter, or what kind no, of no, toast no, are we no, talking no. about? We're talking about adult toast where, you know, they, Ooh, get, they, okay. they get to come sit at the Podfather table. They get to have a glass of vino with the Podfather. Ooh, some wine and breaking bread with the Podfather, exactly. right? And okay. They, they get toasts. They get to say, hey, the Podfather is accepting of you. Good job. And uh, the first couple will be for the, you know, the inaugural Podfather Toast Award. We'll go to Ian Kinsler, who's batted well over 300. A hot start to the season, has been a true leader, and a guy that's hitting very well and very well, solid defensively. And to Nick Castellanos, who is a guy that has been uh, much a, you know, he's very controversial. He's very a player that a lot of people have looked to and complained about. But he came off of a, a good stretch there where he was hitting home runs, where he was driving in runs. And he was a player that is trying to uh, turn around his perception of him, be less polarizing. I think that he's going to evolve to be a professional major league hitter. So the first two Podfather toasts go to Ian Kinsler, Nick Castellanos. And uh, each and every podcast will try to single out some positives and those that are welcome at. So I'll be the negative guy? I'll be the Drew Sharp of the podcast then you're saying? (laughs) Is that what you're saying to me right now, Doug? No, no, I'm definitely, I have my share of negativity. You have some negativity in you too, yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. I I played back some of the old podcasts that you can find on YouTube, our YouTube page, where we have an overwhelming archive of, of a lot of the podcasts we've done. And when they hired Brad Ausmus, man, Adam and I were absolutely livid. We were just like, how could you give the keys to the Ferrari to a a young manager? This is probably going to be a disaster. We even questioned ourselves whether we were being too negative. But this team with a $200 million payroll should not be handed to Brad Ausmus. And in the end, this is a guy that's getting screwed. This is a guy that's going to be fired. And whether it be somebody that deserves it or not, it doesn't look like with the, he's going to fall under the weight of the expectations. So I have my share of negativity. I, I can be um, you know overreacting like a fan, but I don't care. Oh, you have overreacted. We know that I, much. I, I you have, have done the overreacting. I've told you to calm down and relax before like yes, Aaron Rodgers. Listen, listen I, you know, people say, oh, calm down. It's a long season. Listen, it is. It's a marathon, we're, listen, man. We're here recording now. I'm not. I here. know. It's about I'm talking not, about the issues now. I get it's it, It's about too. talking about what is important now, and I'm passionate about it. If I didn't care, I wouldn't talk about it, or I wouldn't look at things. So, you know, people talk about, well, you're too negative, da-da-da. It's just an opinion. And my opinion is that the Detroit Tigers will have wasted about, you know, seven, $800 million in salary with no rings. So, come on now. You have to start looking, you know, a little bit ahead to the future and go, hey, if they don't win a ring with this group, if you can't win a ring with Victor Martinez, Miguel Cabrera, and you have the trio of pitchers who are all Cy Young winners— in Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, David Price, holy camoly, you know, that's a big problem. So you're problem. saying because they couldn't win then, they're not going to win now. Are you saying that? You're making that statement that this team is never going to win a title this with de- this current This decade, club. this decade, from 2010 to 2020, they'll they're be not no going. Rings. There'll be no rings. 
Ringless. Ringless. Oh. In the decade. You're doing that to me? Ringless. Make me feel that bad. Now I got to go cry. Well, you got tissues in the other room. That's good. That's At right. least I know that much. The but. couch is always available, Vito. You know, if you need some <laughs> consultation. But, you know, let's, like I said, the Podfather toasts Ian Kinsler, Nick Castellanos. Let's keep it going. Let's see about, uh, let's, let's see if maybe Miggy next week can continue his hot streak. Maybe V Mart, JD. It's kind of sprinkling hits left and right a little bit. But let's see next week who, who, who gets on the list and who's invited to the table. How about Zimmerman? He's been peerless, yes. using that word. I mean, I know Kinsler has been peerless in his own right, but Zimmerman, how's he not one of the toasts of the week for you? He should be joining the dinner table and drinking some vino wine and high-class Cabernet and all that with you, Doc. Come listen, on, man. Listen, uh, He'd be my toast of the week, at least. For sure. He, he's, you know, on another level. He actually, he basically owns the facility. He owns the table, owns he, the room exactly, and everything, right? Yeah. Exactly. We expected him, hey, for that salary, he should invite me to the table <laughs> and be like, hey, you know, so. You're welcome. To the table as well. Exactly. So now, you know, with the Tigers, you know, to wrap up this podcast, do you feel like, you know, are you one of those people that goes, okay, it's not, we're nine and nine, we're playing a series versus Oakland, it's still too early, things are going to turn around, or are you starting to panic? Because, listen, I don't think, you know, when you just look at it from the, the, the perspective of this season, yes, it's too early, but I'm looking at it collectively. Collectively as a whole, the opinion is, and everyone's talking about it, Osmos is learning on the job. He hasn't gotten better. Has he made moves where you go, hey, he's learning? Or he just he looks he looks like a guy that's just doing his thing and learning on the job, but this is not what we need. We need a advanced tactician manager who's gonna take this group of talent and push it through and maximize the talent. I guess the my, question but, is who is it though? Who wants that job? You know, if Leland doesn't want it, he probably doesn't. He respects mm-hmm. Osmus, has helped him out in that special assistant role. He's not taking over again, okay? He's not walking through those doors at Comerica Park once again. We know that much about Jimbo Jim Leland. My favorite skipper of all time, by the way, as I wrote now another shameless plug here for my Detroit Athletic Company blog pieces wrote about Jim Leland this week, which has been shared now on my Facebook page. Go check it out at Vito Jerome on Facebook. But anyways, after that shameless plug, Leland He's not coming here. So who is going to be that guy we turn to then if we fire Brad Ausmus? Because realistically, we don't want Lloyd McClendon either, who I think is more the interim manager in waiting, but a guy that maybe Alavila doesn't want because he's not analytical enough or of that of that mindset enough. So who do we turn to? Because it's not going to be Ron Gardenhire, by the way, either. We already missed that boat, in o- my opinion. Omar Vizquel, Kirk Gibson. And the thing is, now Kirk Gibson could be a candidate. I would like him, but he's old school. I mean, what are we looking for? Are we looking for the analytical guy? Because we knew Gardenhire wasn't that. We thought Osmus might be. We know Gibson's not that at all. Leland was never that. And Vizquel, he's learning on the job just like Osmus. Don't we want to win this year? You just talked about it. Osmus has been Listen, learning on the job all three years. Vizquel's going to be doing the same thing. Dig, Mr. Journalist. Go find out if Kirk Gibson has been uh, contacted. You, you would know, like him? I, I would like him. You know what? I like him more than Lloyd McClendon. I I'll tell like you that much. He would bring an infusion of passion and energy. I'm just not so sure he's a great manager. I, That's I, a thing, too. Yeah, I mean, he forced Upton out of Arizona when Upton was right. still really good. Right. I mean, what will he do now with Upton? Force yeah. him out of the lineup? And cause he should be in the lineup Maybe right Kirk now, Gibson man. was right. And he should have. That been. was way long ago now. Though. Right. No, that's true. Yeah. yeah. But 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 maybe he foreshadowed the fact that Justin Upton wasn't a guy that he would want on his ball club that would that would compete for a championship. Maybe it's not Justin Upton. <laughs> One ball player, though. I would like to see what Gibby would do at this ball club. Now he would emphasize more of the base running, and I think the guys would cut down on their base running mistakes. We talked about that last week. Those base running blunders and Castellanos. I mean, how many guys, man, have gone through that? Way too often. And it's too bad a guy like Miguel Cabrera, Doc, who's a smart base runner, isn't more speedy and or fleet of foot because he would be stealing bases left and right, Miguel, because he has those instincts to be a good base runner. He is a smart guy out there on the base paths, but he's not fast enough to steal bases, you know, to take those extra bases. When he hits a single that could really be a double, well, he's staying at first because he's slow. It's too bad. Now, the guy that I want to pinpoint here in this discussion, just to talk about a little bit, is Iglesias, who's still not a great base runner and still can't steal bases because he's not smart enough out there on the base paths. That's why it doesn't necessarily guarantee anything when you're a speedy base runner. doesn't mean you're going to steal 20 or 30 bases per season. And I think Iglesias is an example A of that. And that's another issue that I have with Brad Ausmus. Why haven't these guys gotten better on the base paths? Aren't you teaching these guys up, coaching them up to where they become better base runners? He hasn't done that either. And what really has he done? I'll say this. This is bad. This is bad. A lot of things are bad with him, and he hasn't done enough to warrant him staying past this year. I mean, this is early to say that, but as of right now, obviously he hasn't, and he would be fired. And I was telling my dad my brother, too, if they were to go on like a seven-game losing streak right now, Doc, he'd be gone after that seven-game losing streak. Oh, uh, yes. 
you refreshed my mind regarding a question I put on our Detroit uh, podcast Twitter page. I had said that, and a lot of people were like, no, it'll never happen. Listen, when, when someone asks a question, you have to remove the hypothetical out. It's not like, is he going to do it or not? I had said that if you had known that the Tigers would lose the next nine or ten games, or let's just say they go on a ten-game losing streak, and Brad Ausmus would be fired, would you take it? Would you say, you know what, let the Tigers go on and lose the next ten games if you knew that Brad would be gone? Not that are they going to do it, is it going to happen, but if you knew that for Brad Ausmus to be fired, the next ten games would all be losses, would you take it? No, still no. I want to see oh, my Tigers you know, succeed. Come on, man. I'm not that critical. Well, you saw I've been short very critical term, of them. Short term. But that could be hurt. detrimental. No, that could be more than just short term. Come on. Listen, no. Ten, game, but, ten but games to lose Brad in a row? Brad Ausmus at the helm of this team could be detrimental for years to come. No, he's not. I just think this way. I don't think he'll be here after this season, so we don't need to do that to make him get fired. I think by the end of the season, he will be fired anyways because the Tigers will still underachieve a little bit or barely make it in and then lose in the first round. And then they'll notice at that point that Avila will say to himself, you're out of here because we can get another manager who can lead us past the first round, which Ausmus obviously hasn't done as of yet. And I don't think will do in his tenure as skipper of the Tigers. And not to his fault completely. The team might not be good enough to get past the first round if they make it there this year. So it's a flawed team. It is. And that has to deal with the organizational higher-ups too. Okay? Their philosophies of building this ball club. And that's why the blame can never be totally placed upon the shoulders of Brad Ausmus. But who will be the scapegoat by the end of the season if they miss out on the postseason? Obviously Brad Ausmus. No doubt about it. And really... I think it might be warranted after three years of where you you said it best really earlier. He hasn't learned much, has he? In three years where he's learned on the job and his first year was all right. You know, he was kind of unscathed of anything because, well, it was his first year as a big league manager, as a big league coach in totality. And uh, he proved he wasn't good enough. And then since then, has still not proved to be good enough. And with that, Doc, I, I think he will be out of a job. Will he be the manager by our next recording? I think he will be. <laughs> oh. he, they would have to go on. A, here's a bold prediction. They would have to go on a 10 game losing streak or something like that right now for him to be forced out this early in the season. And Doc, thank you for always being along with me and to Rashad Phillips. Great insight from him on Tyler Collins, his miscue in the outfield, calling off the fans. That was ugly. That was an ugly mark on his image. And also for him talking about Bakari and his boy there and uh, what he will bring to UDM on the sidelines. Memo to athletes keep your fingers to yourself. Please, please. And remember also on social media to think before you press send. There you go. Vito Churko signing off for episode 38 of Tiger Stock with Churko and Company. Goodbye.